Well, it's just about time to run. We have been through a lot together. We've been to some of the most beautiful places in the world. We've talked to some of the most interesting people. We've seen wonderful things. You have had a chance to learn how the world works in a really fundamental way. Um, we have crossed over a whole lot of the earth sciences in a very short period of time. And now you're going to go off and take that knowledge. And I hope you're going to go on a road trip. You're going to go see something really dramatic, go to some of these national parks, learn some of the things in real life that you've seen in our slides, and have a great time. I hope you know that Shredar and I are really excited about this subject, that we really believe it matters to you. You do have these little things that, you know, occasionally there's a little grading, occasionally there's a little exam, and so we thought it would be useful to walk through a little bit of a review with you. And so I'm going to start you off on, on some reviewing things here. Um, this is actually a picture that, that I took in Alaska of some stuff that was scraped off of an ongoing subduction zone slab. And um, then there's been landslides, and there's been glacier erosion, and there's a whole bunch of beautiful things in this national park shown right here up in Glacier Bay. And um, <laughs> to make it easier, I hope, um, I'm going to try to sing you the course. I'm going to walk us through a couple of verses, uh, sort of the first half of the course, what Sridhar taught, and a little of what I did. Um, then we'll stop and we'll write some overheads. And then I'll sing you through the rest of the course, the stuff that I did. I'm trying a little more than we did in the course. If one song, we can do the whole course in a little extra. Um, and then we'll stop and write some more things, and then I will bid you a pleasant good life. Um, and hope that we'll meet somewhere in a park down the road. And so we'll walk you through a little a little singing here. Um, and so I'm going to try desperately to sing this somewhere vaguely in tune and see what we come up with. Um, the chorus is an opinion. Okay, the science, I'm giving you science in here, but when we get down to the chorus, this is an opinion. You don't have to parrot back what I say, but I really believe this. So let's see if we can get somewhere interesting here and see what we can do. I did a lot of this with you. I hope you remember. Earthquakes and volcanoes dry the currents of the deep. And the growing days of mountains and they keep the rivers steep. They tell us where they'll happen. They may even tell us when. If we listen, we'll be ready there and then. Rocks beneath the mountains and the buds beneath the sea. When the fossils press inside them, tell others deep the story. Formation and bombardment blazing heat and bitter cold. So by living as the new wheels on the old. How to live with our mother. On this group of love, and the fatal 
Okay, so there is about half of the course in a very short order. Uh, I'm going to try to flip over just a little bit, and we're going to change speakers on you. We have this wonderful AV set up from the really good work, and I think we actually will have made this work. And so now let's see if we can do a little bit of review on things that we've looked at. So we'll switch over here, and now this is going to be um, more familiar. Okay. In the course, we started sort of back at the beginning. We said, hey, the universe is older than the Earth is. There were some stars. They blew up. They made very interesting things that floated around in a solar nebula. And eventually, it all fell together to make the Earth. And so the Earth formed by stuff falling down under gravity. Stuff fell together. You know, this is really technical. I hope you're with me on this. So stuff fell in to form the Earth. And when stuff falls together, it gets hot. And there was a lot of radioactivity then. And so we had, um, the stuff got hot. And so it heated. And the heat mostly from radioactivity. And the heat led to melting. And the melting led to separation into layers. And this one, you sort of remember, if you've ever driven in the north in the winter, and you, you drive along and you get snow and ice on the bottom of the car, and there's rocks in it, and there's salt in it, and there's little dead squirrel parts in it, and all that kind of stuff, and you drive in the garage, and it melts, it separates. And so in the same way as the planet melted, it separated into layers, a dense core to the middle, a little scuzz that floats on top that is the crust in the atmosphere, and a big, thick mantle in between. Okay, so we looked at the different layers, and then we said, okay, there's still radioactivity, and that is still making it hot, and so there's some heat left from a long ago, but mostly there's radioactivity, which makes it hot, and when you make things hot, whether it be the Hershey bar in your pocket, or whether it be the center of the Earth, they get soft. And so it makes it hot, and the hot makes it soft, and the soft makes it flow. And in fact, down there, stirring in the mantle, the mantle currents flow. They have convection cells down there. And so we have convection down deep in the mantle moving things around. And you may remember the convection sort of looks like this. And on top of that, there are big slabs of rock. And on top of that is your house, big house. OK, so um, you can possibly remember going over some of this a little bit back. And so we have soft flowing down below, and we have hard breaking up above. And we live on the hard breaking, so we sort of talk about the hard breaking most of the time rather than the soft flowing, because we're sort of us-centric most of the time. Okay. So when we looked at this, we found that the upper layers of the planet are broken into a few big chunks, which we call plates. And so there are plates that are wrapping around on the convection cells. And you know that if you're on a raft um, going down the river, if you sit in the middle of the raft, it's sort of boring. And if you hang your fingers over the edge, they'll get nibbled on by the catfish, or they'll get crushed when you run into another raft. The action is at the edge. That's the bumpering sort of happens. And so we looked at the interactions of these plates at their edges. And we said there's really sort of three things they can do. They can slide past each other. They're not coming towards or away. They're just sliding past. And we said in a slide past sort of world, you don't get a lot of mountain building, but you do get earthquakes. And so slide past, you can get quakes. And the example that we talked about, there aren't many national parks devoted to sliding past. And the reason is it doesn't make big, pretty valleys, and it doesn't make big, pretty mountains. But the San Andreas Fault that tries to knock down LA and San Francisco is a good slide past boundary. And so we talked about the San Andreas as the big fault that is a slide past in the west. And um, it serves as a good example of this. We get national parks at the other two kinds of boundaries. Um, we looked at uh, pull-apart boundaries. In fact, we started way back when at a pull-apart boundary. Um, that was Death Valley. 
And Death Valley, remember, is sort of unzipping. California moving away from the mainland a little bit. Uh, not as fast as they think they are, but nonetheless they are. And south from there, we went out into the Gulf of California, which was unzipping, and out into the great mid-ocean ridges that are unzipping. And so what we found at pull-apart boundaries is if you start one in a continent, you get pull-apart faults, you get earthquakes, you get Death Valley. Um, and if it keeps unzipping, the rift valleys of Death Valley will make seafloor. And so eventually you get seafloor, and we saw that a little bit of melted rock leaks up the crack. You get a little basalt coming up the cracks, and so you get basaltic volcanoes that are leaking up from the mantle, and they cool and harden and make the seafloor, and then there's seafloor spreading. Stuff is moving away from the center of this as, as things leak up. And so you may possibly remember diagrams that sort of look something like this, with this going this way and this going this way and a red volcano let's make a red volcano a red volcano coming up like this from below and the stuff freezing and so um there are very interesting boundaries there's fun stuff that happens at them and they do give us some national parks the biggest deal for getting national parks turns out to be at the push together boundaries and so we have push together boundaries and this one there's a couple types and you will possibly recall that when old seafloor gets really cold, it gets dense enough to sink back into the mantle. And so old, cold seafloor will sink into the mantle. And when that happens, you get what we call a subduction zone. So this is at a subduction zone. And in the subduction zone, we had all kinds of national parks. We had stuff scraped off the downgoing slab. And when you scrape stuff off, you get the hills of San Francisco. You get the hills that the redwoods are growing on. You get Olympic National Park. So there's a huge number of fun things that happened out there. So we have scrape off. And scrape off gives us Olympic. And that was a really fun national park to visit. I hope you remember that one. It was a pretty one. And we also have a little bit of sediment and water go down. So a little of the sediment doesn't get scraped off. It goes down. Sediment goes all the way down, and water goes down. And what we found is that when you put water in the system, water lowers the melting point. And so you're taking this slab down, there's friction, there's heating, and you do some melting down there. And that melting is a very special melt that has water in it and it has a lot of silica in it. And so this makes melt, and the melt comes up, but the melt has water in it. And when the water gets up to the surface, either it sort of bubbles off nicely and you get really slow gooey lava flows, or it bubbles off not nicely and you get things that blast into the stratosphere and change the climate and kill everybody around. And you make stratovolcanoes and you make all sorts of interesting things. So this gave us andesite as the rock, and this was one with more silica than basalt. You sweated the andesite out of the, out of the basalt, essentially. And you get stratovolcanoes, and the stratovolcanoes, you will remember, are things such as Mount St. Helens or Crater Lake. And Crater Lake, you know, is a big hole. That mountain is spread out across the Badlands and out across Yellowstone and, you know, it's spread around the world. Um, and so we had Mount St. Helens and we had Crater Lake and other sorts of interesting things that were sitting there like that. We also noted that there are earthquakes at subduction zones. Most of them are the same as other kinds of earthquakes. It sticks and it slips and it sticks and it slips. And there may be some really deep ones that as you squeeze the downgoing rock, it just sort of collapses or implodes. And so we saw there are earthquakes. And at subduction zones, the earthquakes include normal or stick-slip um, sort of motion, elastic rebound. We talked about there where they get stuck they're like a rubber band, and then boom, they let go. And then, then there were special implosion earthquakes as the stuff was going way down to great depth, and it's getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, and finally it just caves in. Um, so we'll call those implosion quakes. Okay, so there is all kinds of activity going on. At subduction zones, there are trenches offshore, and there's volcanic arcs. 
And so we have trenches and we have arcs, volcanic arcs. The cascades are a wonderful example. The ring of fire, the whole ring of fire is basically this. And so if you're a Johnny Cash fan, you may remember the Ring of Fire. The Ring of Fire. Anyway, okay. <laughs> okay, so that was subduction. Pushed together with one side going under the other. We also noted that there is a different kind of push together. As long as one side says, yeah, I'll go under, you go over, it's fine. They come together and one goes under. And but what happens when two of them come together and no one will go down? They're both too buoyant, they stay on top, and then you get a big collision. And so we noted that there is push together obduction. Obduction is against, obdurate, ob, you know obstinate, ob is running up against, and so push together obduction, and this is the big collision. Neither side goes down, so neither side down, and so things run into each other, and they get squeezed and squoze and folded and bent, and you know, you get this kind of stuff going on, Wee! and um, it's a real mess. Um, the Appalachians are an obduction. The Himalaya today, the biggest mountain ranges are this. And so the Great Smokies are a wonderful example of what happens in abduction. Um, and the Himalaya today are the same thing. And there are many other examples around the Urals um, are another example and so on. And so you get pushed together faults. You get folds. Um, so you end up with pushed together faulting and folding. You get earthquakes. Um, all sorts of things happening, folds, folds, quakes, um, lots of activity. A thing that often happens, if you take something that's long and skinny and you squeeze it, it gets short and fat. And the mountains go up, but the root goes down. And so we talked about how as you squeeze things in abduction, it makes a big root. And the bottom of that root gets really hot. And then erosion takes the top off, and the bottom of the root bobs up. And it brings very interesting metamorphic rocks, and it brings ores and gems and all sorts of stuff from up there. And so the collision thickens the rock, and the mountains get a root. And so you might look at it as something like this. If one side is coming in, and the other side is coming in, and they're headed towards each other, and then you have a giant collision, what do you end up with? So this is um, at some time, this is early, and then when you see this later, what do you end up with? You end up with the top has been pushed up, and the bottom has been pushed way down. In fact, it goes farther down than it comes up. And so you thicken it, and you get a mountain, and you get a root. And then when you come in and erode the top, the bottom bobs up. And that brings hot stuff up to the surface. And so erosion brings rocks from way down, allows the root to bob up the way a, an iceberg bobs up if you cut the top off. And it brings very interesting things from depth to the surface. And so you can find rocks that are right at the surface that have been way the heck down earlier. Okay? And that was sort of our complete picture of the big stuff. Now, you know, there's volcanoes and there's earthquakes and there's tsunamis and all kinds of dangerous things that go with this, and we, we talked about those a little bit. We also talked about one other thing that was floating around here, which is this was the interactions of the plates. But the mantle is still down there churning away deeper. And occasionally there are these things called hot spots. And the hot spots are coming from below the place. They're coming from way down. They're like giant thunderstorms or giant atom bomb explosions that are coming from below. And they're pushing up. And they will poke through the place. So we also noted that there are hot spots, hot spots, and they come from below the place. They may come from the core mantle boundary. Probably some of them are deep, and some of them are not quite so deep. Normally, they're sort of like seafloor rocks. They're basalts. They erupt quietly at volcanoes. So they usually make quiet vol basaltic volcanoes. And quiet means that, you know, it'll throw a rock a mile, but it won't throw it 100 miles. Um, so um, cause quiet basaltic volcanoes. You still don't want to go have your picnic right next to one unless you're fairly careful. Um, the best example of this is 
the hot spot of Hawaii, the giant island of Hawaii. The volcanoes there have all come from a hot spot feeding up from below. It makes a mountain, the mountain drifts away on the, the moving plate. It makes a new mountain, it drifts away, and so on. And so Hawaii is the best example of this. Occasionally, a hot spot comes up below a continent. And in trying to wiggle its way through the continent, made of all that andesite with all that silica, it gains silica. And as it gains silica, it may get water, and then it becomes explosive. And so Yellowstone is also a hot spot. But Yellowstone, when it blows up, blows up really big. And so occasionally, a hot spot will get wet and silica rich coming through a continent gets water and silica from a continent and silica as it's trying to come through. Usually you're out in the ocean because there's mostly ocean. But if you're coming through the continent, when you get the silica and the water, then you blow up. And Yellowstone is the best example of such a hot spot that we have today. It may not come from as deep. Um, but there's this long trail. The Craters of the Moon is out along the trail. And the pot is still under there. It's sort of under the northeast part of the park. And it's still simmering under there, getting ready to have the next big one. So that is sort of how you make mountains. That's all the big stuff drifting around. That's sort of the whole story of, of what we did so far. Um, the next thing we did is to say, OK, mountains are not forever. You put one up, and something's going to beat up on it eventually. And so we said, hey, what beats up on it? We have the sun. The Earth's heat comes mostly from radioactivity. The climate's heat comes mostly from the sun. And so we said sun drives climate, and climate makes rain and snow. And we talked a little bit about how lifting air cools it and makes rain so that you can have the redwoods. So lifting cools air because it expands and it's doing work. And that cooling makes rain. And that rain can give you things such as the redwoods, which we enjoyed, or I hope you enjoyed. I love going to the redwoods. Um, so that was very nice. But rain also beats up on rocks. Um, you put water in the cracks, it freezes and expands. You put water through the air, and it picks up a little bit of acid. You put acid on the rock, and it changes it chemically. And so the rain and snow and temperature and all the stuff of weather changing temperature and what have you um, ends up giving us beat up rocks. It changes rocks. And we call those changes weathering because they're done by weather. This is really not rocket science, sorry. Um, OK, so there's changes in the rocks. There's physical and chemical changes. And what they do is they make little pieces where they make stuff that dissolves and washes away. And so we looked at this as to give little pieces. The little pieces give you soil. You can grow crops because things get broken up like this. Um, and they give you things that dissolve and wash away. Okay. And the little pieces sit around for a while in that soil, and it's good. But then they sort of slide downhill, and that's mass movement. And if your house is on top of that when it happens, or if your house gets buried by that, then that's bad. And so um, eventually, you get gravity pulls the little pieces down. And so we call this mass wasting. Because it's mass, and then you're sort of wasting it. You're not keeping it on your, your hill your, or your farm. Um, and so mass wasting is moving things down. And more or less, naturally, new little pieces are made about as fast as the old ones slide off. And the sliding off may be very slow. Soil creep, you know, a rock at a time, a gopher hill at a time, or something like that. It can be really fast. The whole mountainside falls off, and it buries it down, and it kills everybody, and it's not good. And you call it a landslide or something like that. But this goes from you know, a fraction of an inch a year to um, 100 miles, 200, 300 miles an hour um, or more. Um, so, so there's this great, great range of things. And eventually, you get to the bottom of the hill, but there's a stream there or a glacier. Um, and so eventually, the mass wasting feeds rivers. Um, and we look a lot at the, the very clear thing that a river is not a water pipe. It is a water and sediment pipe. It has to move the water it receives, but it also has to move the rocks that are sliding into it or, or falling into it or creeping into it. 
And um, if you tweak with a river, it makes a difference. You put a dam across the river and make a lake, the lake fills with rocks. Um, and the river below the dam comes out clean and it picks up more rocks so it erodes. And so you go down the Grand Canyon and the sandbars are washing away because the dam's trapping the sediment, the clean water comes out, it picks up more rocks. And so the rivers move rocks as well as water. And you forget that at your peril. Some people have forgotten that on occasion, and then they've ended up being very unhappy about that. And so if you build a dam to make a reservoir, the lake fills with rocks. It may take a while. It may be very fast. Some of them, and one landslide comes in, and boom, it's full already, and it's not good with much. And the clean water that comes out tends to wash away sand below. And so clean water coming out will pick up more rocks. And so there is a lot of effort going on in the Grand Canyon now. How do we get sandbars back? Because the sandbars are where the cottonwoods root that grow up, that the birds live in. The, you know, you need these for the ecosystem. Uh, it's really hard if you're a deer to stand on the rock wall and get a drink. You sort of want a sandbar there. And so um, because the dam is trapping the sand, the river comes out below the dam. It washes the sandbars out of the Grand Canyon. And so that's a big deal. Um, OK. Now, if you get cold, you don't get rivers, you get glaciers. And they pretty much do the same job. They move rocks and they move water from high to low. And so the river is taking the rocks and the water downhill, and the glacier is taking the rocks and the water downhill, too. Uh, there are some differences. Uh, glaciers do get to the ocean in, um, in Antarctica. They do get to the ocean in Greenland. They don't get to the ocean in many other places. Um, let me back up for just a second. Sorry, I should have made a point about New Orleans. So back up for a moment. Uh, if you go back to rivers, when you make a pile of rocks and mud, it's sort of squishy. And so when the river, when the Mississippi gets down to the ocean, it makes a big pile of mud. And so New Orleans is sitting on some miles of mud. The deepest piece of the Mississippi Delta is about seven miles thick. And so when the, the river reaches the ocean, um, it may make a big pile of mud called a de delta. Unless it all washes away. If, you, if the river is really weak and the ocean is really strong, it just washes it all away to the beaches. But if the river is strong and the ocean is weak, you get a big pile of mud. OK, so it makes a mud pile. And we call that mud pile a delta. And the delta of the Mississippi is very deep and it's very long. And it, it sinks under its own weight. You make mud and watch it sort of go squish. And so the mud squishes. And if you put a city on top of that, this is a technical term, too, mud squishes. You put a city on that, it squishes, too. And so for years, we taught students about what was going to happen in New Orleans. Everybody knew it. It was getting lower and lower and lower as the mud squished. And everybody knew that eventually the hurricane was going to get it. It did. And now they're taking your tax dollars and they're rebuilding it so it can happen all over again. Um, and then you can pay for it again. And so um, New Orleans has been sinking, um, sinking New Orleans. And it will sink more. And if they raise it up, that will buy time. It's only sinking sort of that much per year. But eventually, you know, it, it gets there um, as the mud squishes. There's some other things going on down there as well. You pump oil and gas out from underneath, and it squishes some more. And uh, you load it up. And so there's all sorts of things there. OK, so that was back to rivers. Now let's go around and go back to glaciers. Um, glaciers are the cold rivers. They grab stuff. They move it down. They go from where there's snow to where there's melt. Um, and there are lots of places across a, a third of the world that had glaciers fairly recently. And so when we go looking at glaciers, uh, what we find is that they have been a lot bigger and a lot smaller. We have ice ages. So we see the history of ice ages. Right? And the ice ages were paced by the Earth's orbit. The Earth's orbit has wiggles. The spin axis, if this is the North Pole, as you know, the spin axis is tilted over a little bit. Um, and if 
it wiggles. It goes a little farther over and a little less over. And if you can think of my bulb spot up here as being the North Pole, if it stuck straight up and the sun was shining in on my nose, the North Pole would never get a sunburn. Because it's tipped over, it gets a sunburn. And if it tips over more, it gets more of a sunburn. It doesn't change the amount of sun reaching the planet, but it changes whether it's on my nose that's getting sunburned or it's on my bulb spot. And so this and a couple of other wobbles, this one and this one, um, end up changing the sunshine. And those have paced ice ages. And so changes in the orbit paste ice ages. These things take tens of thousands of years. They don't matter for next year. They don't matter for next century. They do matter um, for 100,000 years from now. And so this is slow over tens of thousands of years. It was a very interesting thing, though, that if, if my bald spot is getting more sun, um, my nose isn't. And there's some wiggles that mean when my bald spot's getting more sun that the south pole is not getting more sun. But what's happened is the whole world has an ice age together, and the whole world comes out of an ice age together. And the remarkable, remarkable result has been that as the sun changes in the north, it changes dust fluxes to the ocean and some other things, and that has affected CO2. And so what we have actually been able to see, and this is a, a very interesting, very useful result, is that the north, where most of the land is, has controlled, has controlled the world when it comes to ice ages. So the world has gone with northern sun, has followed sun in the north. The south is coldest when it gets the most sun. And the reason is that northern sun controlled CO2. And CO2 controlled the world's climate. Now, how did that work? Um, we told you a story in the textbook, um, which isn't complete. Um, it, the ocean is, is blue and it's not green because there aren't a lot of plants in some places. And there aren't a lot of plants because there isn't enough fertilizer. And sometimes the fertilizer is iron. And dust supplies iron. And when there's an ice age in the north, there's lots of dust supplying iron to fertilize the ocean to grow plants, which take CO2 and make plant, which get eaten by animals, get pooped into the deep ocean, and that lowers CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and that's part of the story, but that's not the whole story. Don't get too excited about that particular one. The point is, is that northern sun has controlled CO2. CO2 controlled the world's climate. And this is one of many indications as we look at history that say, hey, CO2 matters. If you tweak CO2, you're going to know about it someday. OK? So we, we looked about that far. And, and at that point, Sridhar bid you a, a cheerful, good day, and he passed things over to me to chat with you. And so at that point, I'm going to stop for a moment. I'm going to try to switch from, from one microphone to another. I'm going to try to switch to our, um, our words here and give you the rest of the story, the rest of the song. Um, this will include some things that um, are extra that we haven't talked about in class. But just give me a moment here. The magic of technology. The guys that set this up are really good, in case you're curious. Wonderful people working for Penn State, the E-Education Institute, and other places here. And so if we can get back on tune, I'm terrible on tune. Yes. Little sun and water, it's here to Oxygen up in the sky from plants down here below. We burn the plants with oxygen, the sunlight energy. Add nitrogen to plant plants, you and me. Almost all the plants have been recycled for four billion years. Just a little dead was very deep, but nothing disappears. Wheels of industry are driven by this fossil fuel. CO2 may blow the planet's cool. But we're learning how to live with a 
that you are not responsible for. We will switch mics. So we... And I think we're now on and ready to roll. We'll go back to the writing on things and something maybe I'm a little more familiar with here and see if we can roll through the rest. We're getting closer and closer to recent times, so I'm not going to put quite as much detail on that because you probably are more familiar with it at this point. Um, what we did next was to notice that that sediment goes down to the beach. And so we chatted a little bit about beaches, which are a lot of fun. And we noticed that a beach is really sort of a river. There's water moving along it, and it's carrying sediment from here, from the river, down to fall into deep water to go in the subduction zone and come back out. And so we looked at beaches as sort of being like rivers in terms of getting sediment from somewhere, sediment from the river, and taking it somewhere, dumping it into deep water. And so this is the, the sediment from the river and to deep water. And while it's in transport, um, we enjoy it because we like to go down and see it. If it loses more than it gains, the beach gets narrow. And when the beach gets narrow, the waves come over and they tear apart your house. Um, and so if it's too much loss or too little gain, then you get erosion. The waves are coming across the beach because there isn't enough beach there. As we build dams on rivers, we promote beach erosion. The rising of the sea level at the end of the, end of the last ice age traps sediment way up in bays, it gives you beach erosion. Um, a lot of things do. Sea level is also rising, and that's drowning the beach, and that narrows the beach, and then you get beach erosion. And that may be the biggest factor right now, is that sea level is rising because mountain glaciers are melting and the ocean is warming and expanding, and sea level is rising, and that in turn gives you narrower beaches because you're flooding things. And as you get a narrower beach, you get erosion of the beach. And about three quarters of the coasts of the U.S. are being, being pushed back inland right now because of various things, but sea level rise may be the biggest one going on there. Okay. So then we said, fine, that closes a loop. We have our subduction zone, we made mountains, we washed them or glaciered them down along the rivers, we took them to the beach, we go along the beach, they fall in deep ocean, what happens? They go down the subduction zone or they get squeezed in the subduction zone and you get mountains again. And so this ended up, once you get to deep water, the sediment can end up either in a subduction zone or eventually getting squeezed in an obduction zone. 
And after you have been subducted or abducted, it goes back to mountains, and you can start over again, which is really sort of cool. A lot of these things work, and they work very nicely. All right. Then we said, fine, while we're waiting for the sediments to all get subducted or abducted, can we learn anything from them? Is there something interesting going on in here? And so at this point in the game, we started looking at those sediments, the mud in the lake, the mud next to the beach, in various places. And we noted something, that when we look at sediment, we can do a couple things with the sediment. We can tell the environment in which it was deposited. Is this the deposit from a lake? Is it from a river? Is it from deep ocean? Is it from a desert? And so it reveals the environment in which it formed. And this is based on fossils, and it's based on the characteristic of the sediment itself. Glaciers make different things than wind does. And so the sediment reveals the environment. It also gives us clues to time. And we looked first at relative time, which one came first, which one came later. So we looked at relative age, older or younger. And we found that we could put things in order. It has to be there before you can cut it. The younger ones are on top. And if they get flipped upside down, we saw that we could tell that nature had flipped it over. And so we looked a good bit at um, up indicators. And if you didn't get that, yeah, it's, a, it's a cool thing. It'd be nice to know. So we, we looked at up indicators, the things that will tell you whether nature actually went and turned something upside down by folding it. So whether you had uh, a layer and then, whoa, it got rolled over and some of it was upside down, we happened to know that there was something on top. And if you find that something that was on top on the bottom, it got turned over. And so it was almost as simple as that. And we looked at mud cracks and other things like that. And so we found that we could tell histories. What happened at a place when? Because if you can tell who's first, who's later, and what the environment was, this is a history. We then looked at age real seriously. We said, OK, we know older and younger. Can we put years on it? And so we looked at age. And we looked for the number of years. And we did that in three ways. First, we counted annual layers. And this takes a lot of pain and agony and being really careful that you're not fooling yourself and cross-checking and comparing the written histories and all sorts of things like that. And what we found is that simply counting tree rings, simply counting lake sediments, simply counting ice core layers, there are more annual layers than all of recorded history. And so the first thing was that there's more years in sediments than all of recorded history. And that is in the mud. That's in the trees. That's in the ice. We're not even down in the rocks yet. There's a lot of rocks down there. So then we started looking at the rocks, and we found that they are not catastrophes in general, that we sort of recognize them. They're from rivers and lakes and sand dunes and things like this. And we tried to add up how much time was in the rocks. And we found an immense amount of time, more than 100 million years, probably a lot more than 100 million years. So we did these uniformitarian things where we said, at sort of vaguely modern rates, how long to make this? And we saw vast, deep time in the rocks. Deep time is a term we love. It just means old, 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 old. OK, so to explain the rocks we see, no one has come up with any plausible explanation that does not involve deep time. Then we finally looked at the radioactive clocks, and we were able to put number of years on this. And so we finally ended up using radioactive clocks to get, get real numbers. And we found a world that's about 4.6 billion years old. And we've sort of recognized it for the last half billion or so. And so this went to really old. Okay. So we came up with something that looked vaguely like this. There's a lot of stories out there. A lot of changes have happened. Um, you can take another course and actually learn more about the, the details of this history. We did not have time to tell the whole story. One thing that we did note is that in this story, if you put the rocks in order, if you date them, you find that it puts the fossils in order. 
And so what we saw was a canal engineer who had noted that ordering the rocks orders the fossils, puts them in order from oldest to youngest. And this immediately suggested evolution. It doesn't require it. Then we found that people learned mechanisms. We can't conceive of how evolution could not occur given the age of the Earth and given what we know about genetics. Um, and we found the record of that in transitional fossils. And so um, this ordering of the fossils, the law of fossil succession, plus the mechanism and the transitional forms led us to evolution. And it is a very well-founded scientific theory. There's no serious problems floating around here with this. It is something that matters day to day if you're worried about disease organisms. Because it takes lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of generations to see much change. Um, if you're looking for change in, in um, big critters that reproduce slowly, you have to look at fossils. Because big critters don't, don't bleed fast enough to have enough generations to make enough change that you could see it in, in your lifetime. On the other hand, if you're interested in some disease that's inside of you and is, is reproducing like crazy, they can change fast enough that you really need help to keep them in control. And if you don't have that help, then periodically lots of people die. And so we saw that evolution is a practical thing. It's something that when you start talking about disease organisms, it is so fast that we really have to know about it. When you start talking about the big critters, it is so slow that you don't see much change over a human lifetime. So we saw sort of hundreds or thousands of generations to make much change, um, more generations to see even a little bit of change. And what that means is sort of twofold, which is, again, when you're looking at disease organisms, you better know evolution, or somebody that you know better know it. And so for diseases, this is fast compared to us. The diseases are outracing us, and we have to really work hard to keep up with them. So this is faster than us. For other things, if you kill off the big critters, if you have a mass extinction, suppose that we didn't have national parks, suppose we didn't save the big critters, evolution will make new ones, but it will take millions of years. And so essentially, there's sort of, if we lose the biodiversity we have, will nature bring it back? Yes. Will nature bring it back fast enough that it will help us? No. It is very, very slow compared to us. And so for sort of big critters, it is very slow compared to human time spans. Okay, so we got through evolution just fine. Then we had a quick look at fossil fuels and biodiversity. And we noted that, yes, there are fossil fuels out there. You can make a lot of money digging them up um, or pumping them up and selling them to other people. But we noted that eventually the fossil fuels will run out. And so the fossil fuels are large but finite. We noted that if we burn them all, there is very high scientific confidence that we will change the world big time. Okay, So burning all will lead to big changes. And this is very strongly believed scientifically. The evidence for this is very strong. There's no serious argument about this, to be honest. Um, and among those changes will be impacts on biodiversity. If you have Yellowstone and then just people all around it, and the critters in Yellowstone need to migrate and they can't get out of there, they're likely to be fairly unhappy. And so this has impacts on biodiversity, and that's where we ended up last time. And so I won't go into great detail on that, but this is something that matters. That gets us to the end. I hope you know that Sridhar and I and the wonderful people, Eric and others, who have helped put this together for you, care very deeply about this. Um, we actually believe in the future. We believe in students. We believe in the, the, the inherent cleverness of people. We think that you're going to solve the problems. We think you're going to keep the national parks happy and healthy. We have every intention 
uh, when we're old of not being feeble and being out in Yellowstone in September and we hope to see you there. You know, it's going to be a great thing to go do that. I think we're worried, I know I personally am worried, if we don't use your cleverness, if we don't keep an eye on the future, there's so many of us now that we really can screw it up. And it is possible. Right now, people have tried very hard to sort of weigh how much are humans using? And how much do we leave for the elk? How much do we leave for the orchids? And in round numbers now, humans and our immediate friends, uh, cats and cows and soybeans and corn, are sort of using half of everything that the world makes available. And we're leaving half to everything else. And if we keep on the track we're on right now, we humans will double our numbers. Now, if we double our numbers and keep using as much as we're using right now, that means we will be using all. And that, in turn, means it may be very difficult if you're not a cat, a cow, a corn, or a soybean, or a human. Um, we think you'll figure this out, um, but we're reasonably confident that if you go blindly into the future and say somebody else will fix it, that it won't get figured out. Now, this is editorial. You don't have to do what I say. I'm not going to tell you that you have to put this on a final exam so you can pass. We're staying with science on the science class. But, but, you know, we put our lives into this. We care about it very deeply. And so I hope you will forgive me for five minutes or three minutes of actually selling what I believe. And what I believe is that this matters, that you matter, and that we need to keep an eye on the future because if we don't, will be very unhappy. And if we do, our best is still to come. And so I thank you for joining us for a semester. And I hope to see you at the bottom of the canyon or next to Old Faithful sometime down the road. Thank you and take care of yourself.